The year is 1785. Prince Bahadur Shah, a man on his second exile from his homeland, the Kingdom of Nepal, has just learned of the death of his rival, Queen Regent Rahendra Laxmi. They once shared the regency, but this agreement quickly fell into shambles. With her death, her son, the 10-year-old Rana Bahadur Shah, still had nine more years left until he came of age. In the meantime, a regent would need to handle the king's affairs for him. And who better suited for the job than his uncle and previous regent, Bahadur Shah? The prince returned from his exile and took the mantle of regent. His first act was to order for the execution of Swarup Singh, a troublesome court singer who had always caused disruption at the Nepali court. From here, Bahadur marries a relative of Rahendra Laxmi, a princess from the kingdom of Palpa, ensuring the continuation of an alliance. With this annoyance put to rest and an alliance secured, Bahadur restarted what Rahendra had put on hold, the unification campaign of Nepal. The prince regent issues an ultimatum to the kings around him. He gives them two options, become part of the kingdom of Nepal and keep governing your lands as you previously had, or face death and forceful annexation of your kingdom. Most kings do not argue with Bahadur Shah and take his deal, nearly doubling the size of Nepal overnight. A minority of kingdoms to the far west chose to resist the regent, most prominent among them being Joomla. Nepalese armies are then sent to subdue Joomla, but are turned back or forced into long drawn out sieges for the next four years. In the east, the kingdom of Sikkim also rejected the demands of Bahadur Shah. He waits until 1788 to make his move on them. The ruler of Sikkim, Tenzing, is defeated as Nepal conquers the majority of Sikkim, with only a small province in the northeast managing to stave off the Nepalese. With his defeat, Tenzing goes into the safety of exile in nearby Tibet, thus adding more fuel to the Tibetan-Nepali rivalry. The rivalry was not one based on the expansive nature of Nepal. Instead, it was all economics. When Prithvi Narayan Shah blockaded the Kathmandu Valley, the kings of the valley then started to mint low-value coins infused with copper to alleviate their economic situation. These coins were nearly identical to other Nepalese coins, and after Prithvi Narayan Shah conquered the kings of Kathmandu Valley, the counterfeit coins entered the market. Nepali merchants knowingly or unknowingly, began giving these low-value coins to Tibetan merchants. The Tibetans, who were getting the bad end of the deal, pressured the Nepalese to take the coins out of circulation. This would put a huge strain on the Nepalese economy. However, Prithvi Narayan Shah and his successor, King Pratap Singh Shah, both promised to only mint pure silver coins from here on out. The Tibetans were still getting copper-infused coins from Nepal in bulk, and started to give Nepalese merchants low-quality products in return. They were given silk of poor quality, and in a more serious matter, Tibetan merchants began mixing pebbles into the salt they traded with Nepali merchants. Himalayan salt from Tibet was Nepal's main source of the mineral that acted as the best way to preserve food. Without salt, Nepal could enter a famine in no time. The situation was only exasperated when Bahadur Shah allowed for the fugitive Panchen Lama to seek asylum in Nepal. The Panchen Lama was the second most important man in Tibet. The job of the Panchen Lama was to seek out the next reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, who was the spiritual and political leader of the Tibetans. In 1788, Bahadur Shah sent a diplomatic mission to Tibet, with hopes of putting these issues behind them in order to continue the lucrative trade shared between the two lands. The diplomats came back empty-handed. Bahadur Shah intended to show the Tibetans what it really meant to get a bad deal from the Nepalese. The prince regent declared war on Tibet, as Nepalese armies began flooding over the border. The 8th Dalai Lama, Jamfel Gyatso, sent out for his generals to push back the invasion, but they only found defeat. Over the next year, the Nepalese went deep into Tibet, plundering rich monasteries and raiding towns who did not pay them off. Tibet was not a fully independent state, but a tributary state of the Chinese Qing Empire. The 8th Dalai Lama attempted to contact his overlord, the powerful King Long Emperor. The King Long Emperor responded by sending an army into Tibet. By the time that the Chinese army arrived, the 8th Dalai Lama was already pressing for peace talks. 
The Qing general decided not to restart the conflict, but instead stay in Tibet until peace was fully restored. Peace talks were held at the Tibetan city of Kairung, near the Nepali-Tibetan border. The subsequent 1789 Treaty of Kairung would end the war. Nepal had won and demanded from Tibet compensation for damages inflicted during the war and a yearly tribute. In exchange, Nepal would return all land they had conquered in Tibet. The Tibetans paid their tribute to both the Nepalese and the Chinese in the following year of 1790. However, in 1791, no payment was given to Nepal, giving pretext to invade Tibet once more. <laughs>